Good evening, I'm Scott Wapner. On day 86 of this global pandemic, the coronavirus crisis, a developing story this evening, the debate over when it is safe to go back to work as the Dow has its best percentage jump since the Great Depression. I'd love to have it open by Easter. Major Wall Street rally. Stocks are surging. The Dow pops up 11 percent, the best percentage gain since 1933. We're taking actions to preserve cash. We have been dealing with COVID-19 now for nine weeks in China. We've got to be able to adjust that business. When the recovery comes, we're ready to go. CEOs around the country sound off. Tonight, we'll hear what they're doing. The clock has run out. The buzzer is sounding. All while investors around the world wait for Washington to move a crucial stimulus plan forward. This CNBC special report, Markets in Turmoil, starts right now. Here's Scott Wapner. It is good to have you with us once again. Let's give you our first look at the futures tonight after this very big day on Wall Street. And right now, pointing to more gains. The Dow would open higher by some 200 points. S&P 500 by nearly 19. The Nasdaq higher by nearly 40. That's after a day for the record books on hopes of a stimulus deal out of Washington. The Dow notching its biggest point gain ever, more than 2,100 points. And that's 11 percent rise. It's best since 1933. The S&P had its best day since the financial crisis, up 9 percent. The Nasdaq climbing 8 percent. On the Dow, Chevron, American Express and Boeing were all up more than 20 percent. As for the Nasdaq, American Airlines led the way up better than 35 percent. Hasbro, Intuit and Align Technology, 20 percent gains. A big day almost everywhere. For more on today's record rally, let's bring in Michael Aroni from State Street Global Advisors joining us tonight. Michael, what does this say about where we go from here? Is a bottom in or at the very least close? So I think the markets have a three-pronged attack in terms of their combating the coronavirus, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and health policy. And I think what's happening is the markets are applauding the monetary policy actions of the Fed's taken not only yesterday, but beginning last Sunday. The fiscal policy seems to be closed. And now, Scott, what we need is a bit more good news in terms of bending that infection curve, getting some remedies, and potentially seeing some type of vaccination or kind of health remedy to the coronavirus. But um, there definitely seems to be some signs that a bottom are forming. Yeah, but we have to see uh, a peak in cases. Is that what you're suggesting? So I think, as I said, I think from a three, three-pronged idea, I think two of the things are moving directionally in a very positive way in terms of both monetary and fiscal policy. But I do think that we are going to need to see that infection curve begin to slow or some type of health remedy or some type of vaccination. And towards, there's just some of this is going to have to play out over, over multiple weeks until we start to see the virus go dormant. Couldn't help but, but I do think that, yeah, I couldn't help ahead. but, uh, pardon me for interrupting you, I couldn't help but wonder today if you, you're seeing a big run up into the vote, whenever that may be, uh, on the Hill, and then you get the risk of uh, selling on the news, as you sometimes see. Is that a risk here? Potentially, but I think what's interesting, Scott, is that there were a number of signs before today to suggest that the market seemed to have a bottom forming. And I know that's a bit strange to say because the markets were down about 7% over the last three days prior to today's move. But if you look through the internals, some of that indiscriminate selling that we saw in gold and treasuries, they seem to be acting a lot more normally or the way we'd expect. The number of 52-week lows is contracting. The VIX has closed lower for four consecutive days. And other global markets aren't hitting new lows, the Nikkei, the Euro stocks, et cetera. And cyclicals, even today, have been outperforming defensives. To me, all of those things point to the potential for a bottom forming. Yeah, volatility giving us a little bit of a relief as well. Michael, we appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so much. That's Michael Aroni joining us tonight on the phone. President Trump and Vice President Pence, meantime, holding a call today with several prominent investors, including Stephen Schwarzman, Paul Tudor Jones, Robert Smith, Daniel Loeb, and Jeffrey Sprecher. A call my sources described tonight as constructive. I'm told the general conversation was about the economy, that it cannot be allowed to crash, but that a thoughtful approach would be needed on when to reopen things and try to get back to business. That will be key. The president's call to reopen business in the country by Easter, that's 19 days away, has started a big debate in this country this evening. 
with us now is Dr. Tia Powell. She's director of the Montefiore, Montefiore Einstein Center for Bioethics, and Jay Timmons is president and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers. Good to have you both with us this, this evening. Uh, Dr. Powell, I, I turn to you first. Your reaction when the president says he wants things to be open by Easter. Well, um, you know, speaking as a physician, we would all love for things to be uh, better by then. I have no information, none of the data that I've seen, the unbelievable increases in cases that we're seeing in New York City. I see no indication that would support a general resolution or that things will be really looking great 19 days from now. I think the number of deaths will still be increasing. I think uh, we're in an incredibly dire situation and it is actually getting worse day by day in New York City. So, I, you know, I wish I had better news for you. I do not. Jay, so is the president's call too soon? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not a doctor, uh, and I am listening very carefully to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks uh, with the Coronavirus Task Force and the CDC. Uh, but look, here's the thing for manufacturers. We are we are on the front lines right now, and many of our facilities can't shut because we are producing the very, um, very products that our healthcare officials and our hospitals need uh, to be able to fight uh, against this uh, against this outbreak. So our folks are on the lines, and we're also repurposing some of our current uh, existing facilities to be able to handle the personal care products, uh, personal uh, uh, protection products that are so necessary for our frontline healthcare workers. Dr. Powell, it's, it's such a, a delicate a line. You, we, you have to protect people's health at, at all costs, while at some point figure out when a responsible time is to try and restart the economy while taking care of our workers. Um, issue, and uh, I can't, of course, speak to the economic scene. That's not my area of expertise. I will tell you that um, looking at the data from 24 hours ago in New York City, um, almost about 57% of cases are people less than 50 years old. And about a quarter of the deaths, a little bit more than that actually, are people less than 65. So when people say it'll be really easy, we'll just keep everybody vulnerable, uh, inside, and everybody else can go out about their business, and it won't be any more than a summer cold. I just have to tell you, as a physician and an ethicist, I think that is really wrong. Good ethics requires good facts. Young people are not safe. I'm very appreciative of Mr. Timmons' comments. You're right. We've got to get this personal protective equipment made. That's incredibly important that those factories making critical supplies are open. But that's not the same as saying open every restaurant. Let's really just pretend that the problem will be fine in a few weeks. Jay, do you want to answer that? And also, I mean, how should non-critical manufacturers be, be conducting their business now, if at all? You, you don't think that non-critical manufacturing should be going on today, do you? So, you know, that is a very, very good question, Scott. And here's the... Here's the conundrum that we're in. As we are asking more and more manufacturers to repurpose their facilities or, or to, um, to produce something that they haven't necessarily produced before, that means that uh, some of these factories are going to be considered non-critical. That could turn into critical manufacturing. So we have to be very careful to work with, with manufacturers. We're working very closely with our state manufacturing associations as they deal with their governors and their local leaders on how to identify the critical parts of the supply chain and, and, and the manufacturing economy. It's really not that easy to say this is critical, that's not, when you're asking manufacturers all across the country to repurpose their, their operations. Well, I think you understand, though, generally what, what I'm speaking uh, to. If a manufacturer isn't making a personal protective equipment, for example, or a ventilator, and it's a product that is not critical to this current situation, should there, those folks be on the job, on the line? Right. So, or, or if they don't have the capability of doing it. Uh, so I, I get exactly what you're talking about, and I think you're, you're making a very good point. The other thing that we have to think about that most people don't really consider in all of this is we have to make sure that food manufacturers 
and and personal care manufacturers can can be operational because we can't let there be a breakdown in the food supply either. So we have a lot of concerns for our food manufacturers as well as our medical um, uh, professionals being able to obtain those uh, personal protective equipment and supplies because they have to they, they have to be uh, sanitary as well when they're doing their work. Sure. So a lot of this uh, throughout the supply chain and. And I agree with you um, and uh, the doctor that we certainly don't want to see non-essential um, non-essential businesses opening up too soon. And I think we've seen what's happening around the world when you get a, a spike and then a drop and then another spike. We have to be smart about this. But I do think that we can. I do think that we can be smart in the manufacturing sector. And we have been smart, and we will continue to be. Dr. Powell, one of the main issues is the 15-day period that we've been in will end in uh, just about a week. We certainly, as you well know from your position in, in this area, um, the numbers are going to be worse. The, the data is likely to be uh, alarming and, and hard to bear. Yeah, I agree completely. I wish I didn't, but um, it is really going up now. Um, I'm uh, I've been a physician for some decades. I, when I was young, we were in the AIDS epidemic. But the people that I'm talking to and working with, old and young, are physicians who have never seen anything like this before, and we wish we had not seen this. It is really um, just beyond awful. There are so many people who are sick, and figuring out how to provide good or even adequate care to this massive number of people is really, boy, I'll be amazed if we can pull this off. And so... Sending people out and particularly encouraging young people to think they're safe is just going to increase radically the number of people who get sick. So even a small percentage of those people going to the ICU will further overwhelm us. I don't know how we're going to do it. And boy, I hope we can pull through. We appreciate your time uh, this evening. Dr. Powell, Jay Timmons, we'll talk to both of you again soon. Let's bring in now the former FDA commissioner and CNBC contributor, Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Dr. Gottlieb, it's good to see you again. Thanks a lot. This is the, the big debate right now, if you will. The president saying today he wants the economy open by Easter. Quote, you'll have packed churches all over the country. I think it'll be a beautiful time. He talks about reopening large sections of the country, being able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Your reaction to that tonight? Well, look, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We can put a time frame on how long this epidemic is going to last, certainly in New York City, but it's going to last past uh, Easter, unfortunately. I think the epidemic, uh, the governor said it well today, probably another two to three weeks until they peak in terms of the number of cases, and then probably four to six weeks until they come down that epidemic curve. And you really can't take your foot off the brake too hard um, while you're still having new cases and while you're still coming down the epidemic curve. You can start to think about substituting in less restrictive measures for some of the really onerous things we're doing right now, but you've got to be very careful where the epidemic could flare back up again. Um, New York is going to be in a difficult spot in the coming weeks. We're going to see really uh, difficult images coming out of New York as the hospitals begin to come, get overwhelmed. So I think events are going to overtake uh, anything, any kind of uh, contemplation about taking our foot off the brake of mitigation. And the other risk here, and I'll pause here, but the other risk is that other cities are now well seated. And so you could see other cities start to have epidemics, perhaps on the scale of New York, all around the country, and that would extend the national epidemic. Hopefully New York is the epicenter of this and we can get resources into there and take care of New Yorkers. And we've taken aggressive enough steps in other cities to prevent this kind of epidemic spread there. But that's unlikely to be the case. There's probably going to be a few other cities at least that have this kind of spread. So let me ask you, you wrote on Twitter today, quote, there's no easy return. We must accept a sober truth. Should anyone anywhere in this country be back to work on the Easter Sunday or the day after e Easter Sunday or any time in that specific period of time? Well, look, other governors now have an opportunity to lean forward, even in parts of the country where there isn't a lot of spread right now or not a lot of detectable spread. A lot of governors should be leaning forward much more aggressively to try to prevent epidemics and outbreaks in their regions, even if they're not detecting outbreaks right now. What we know is we, we are getting a late start to these um, these epidemics. New York had spread for weeks that they weren't detecting. If we had in place a very good surveillance system around the country right now where we could say with confidence that the virus isn't spreading in different parts of the country, perhaps regionally you could take steps to, to lift some of these mitigation steps in other parts of the country where there wasn't detectable virus 
or where the, the outbreaks were very small and containable, where you can use case-based interventions, basically targeting the individuals with the virus. But we don't have those surveillance systems in place to know really where the virus is spreading. So everyone needs to be alert. Every, every governor, every state should be taking steps right now to try to prevent the kinds of outcomes that we're seeing in San Francisco and Seattle, New York, and probably other parts of the country, New Orleans, parts of Florida, perhaps for Chicago as well, looks like it might be hot right now. Hard to think about a functioning economy at a time where the virus is still spreading. Let's just say by the time Easter Sunday rolls around, as we were just discussing with the prior doctor, the data is going to likely look worse and in more places around this country, as you just said. That's right. And look, this will end. We will get through this. Um, we could put a, a somewhat of a time frame on it. Uh, there's probably a couple of cities that are two weeks behind New York. They'll go through their epidemics depending on when the mitigation steps were taken. Those epidemics might be shorter or longer, but we could put a time frame on this. And that time frame is probably late April, early May, that the country could be coming down the epidemic curve. The number of cases nationally could be peaking at that point. There might be some regions that lag a little bit, but we're starting to come down. And into May and June, we're starting to perhaps replace some of these tough mitigation steps, these population-wide restrictions for case-based interventions where we target individuals with the disease and have in place the surveillance to do that. But now is not the time. We really, what we need to do is get through this and, and stop the transmission. This country can, uh, can get through this. We can't get through this again. We can't afford to let this happen again. So we need to make sure that once we're through this epidemic, this doesn't come back again. You said we can put a time frame on it. Let's just speak of New York City uh, specifically just because of the importance it is to this nation's uh, economy and the hub of business and industry as it is. What is a realistic date in your mind? Not to pin you down and not to come back to you later and said, Dr. Gottlieb, you said this date and now it's not. What is a realistic date this evening for our viewers to consider New York City reopening for some semblance of normalcy? Right. The governor said that the cases are going to peak in two to three weeks based on the New York models. I, I would trust their models. It might be on the better half of that. It might be closer to two weeks. If you look at experience in the Hubei province or even Italy, the time between when they put in place the tough mitigation steps and their epidemics peaked out, the epidemic curve peaked, was about four to six weeks. In the Hubei province, they locked down Wuhan. And six weeks later, they had the peak in the number of cases. So we might be able to get through this. We might get to that peak in four weeks. But remember, then we need to come down. We're still accruing new cases on a daily basis, but the number of cases that are accruing are declining each day. So you still can't take your foot off the brake, but you know you've reached the apex and you're starting to come down. The other thing to note is that in the Hubei province, it took six weeks from the time that they locked down Wuhan to the time that they peaked. But then for another four weeks, hospitalizations continued to increase, and they peaked four weeks after um, the lockdown, four weeks after that six-week period between the lockdown of Wuhan and, and the peak in the number of cases. We're likely to see the same thing in New York. Even as we're coming down the epidemic curve and the number of new cases is declining, hospitalizations will still continue to increase because they lag new cases because it takes the average time to hospitalizations about nine to 12 days. We're talking about the, the race um, daily on getting equipment, whether it's masks or gowns or gloves, uh, ventilators. Just curious as to your reaction, how it's possible that Elon Musk, for example, can get 1,200 ventilators from China almost with the snap of his fingers and get them to California. And states are having such a, a difficult time doing it and getting things from, from the government. Is there a problem in the supply chain? Is the government doing enough to make sure that the states themselves have exactly what they need? Well, we need to look at the national strategic stockpile. Clearly, we didn't have in the stockpile what we should have had. I think one thing we can do is implement enforcement discretion to allow hospitals to import uh, medical products from foreign countries right now. Right now, if you try to import an unapproved uh, medical product, like even an N95 mask, it will be stopped at the border. I think for two months, we can exercise enforcement discretion, allow those products to come in to fill some of the gap in the interim. Dr. Gottlieb, as always, we appreciate your time tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Today's rally on Wall Street driven in part by the hope the Senate is on the verge of passing a stimulus plan. Kayla Tausche has more on the tug of war in Washington. A tug of war, Kayla, we thought many hours ago when the speaker spoke to Jim Cramer was going to be over. Apparently not. 
Scott, negotiators are down to the wire on Capitol Hill. The White House had expected a deal by sundown, but even then, a senior official told me writing the legislation and combing through it would take much longer. The likelihood of a vote happening this evening, extremely low, and the price tag is getting higher once you count what the Federal Reserve is prepared to do. Here's Larry Kudlow earlier this evening. The total package here comes to roughly $6 trillion, $2 trillion uh, direct assistance, Roughly four trillion in Federal Reserve lending power. Again, it will be the largest Main Street financial package in the history of the United States. Liquidity and cash for families, small business, individuals, unemployed to keep this thing going. We're heading for a rough period, but it's only going to be weeks, we think. Now, that represents a dramatic change in messaging at the White House, now touting a strategic reopening of the economy in the near term, when last week President Trump suggested that the economy could be shut down until July. CNBC has learned of an invisible hand in that effort, and that is former Pence chief of staff Nick Ayers. Ayers sits on the board of a global software company and has been asking the White House to consider the impact that these long-term closures could have on the economy. To that end, I've learned that Ayers has been serving as something of a back channel between the White House, Capitol Hill, and corporate America. And among other conversations he's been arranging for the West Wing, that conversation that you reported on earlier, Scott, with the president, the vice president, and major Wall Street titans. After that call took place, President Trump said he thinks that the economic impact could be as high as 25 points to the downside on U.S. growth. And that is one thing that he's trying to get his hands on. Scott? It's going to be stunning once these numbers start to come in. Kayla Tausche, thank you for your reporting tonight. We'll talk to you again tomorrow night. Well, tomorrow night, speaking of, we'll bring you a CNBC town hall, a special, The Pandemic and the Path Forward. It's a look at the future of companies, our workers, investors, and the healthcare industry. On our panel tomorrow night, Gary Cohn, the former chief economic advisor to President Trump, billionaire investor Mark Cuban, plus NASDAQ CEO Adina Friedman, John Rogers of Aerial Investments, and Dr. Scott Gottlieb back with us once again. We do want to hear from you as well. Please send us our questions, to, or your questions on Twitter to hashtag CNBC Path Forward. We'll present them to our panelists tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on CNBC. Our CNBC special report this evening, Markets in Turmoil, is just getting started. Next tonight, on the front lines, fighting the virus. See what emergency room doctors are up against when we speak with one doctor live. Plus, how China's biggest city, Shanghai, is trying to get itself back to normal. That city may be what this country looks like in a month. Before the break, images from around the United States of America on this, the 86th day of the coronavirus crisis. Good to have you back with us tonight. When the coronavirus hit China, American photographer Nikoko was locked down in Shanghai. Tonight, an update from her in her own words. While life is not exactly normal here in Shanghai, things do feel cautiously optimistic. The virus is much more under control here because people took self-quarantine much more seriously from the very beginning. Many shops have reopened and you see a lot more people outside now. However, a lot of businesses were not able to weather the storm and have shut down completely. The amount of locally transmitted cases has decreased, and now the concern is more about importing the virus from abroad. I'm not surprised by what we're seeing in the U.S. right now. First denial, and then panic and hoarding. It's a severe disruption that will last for months, and some of the effects will last for years. Self-sacrifice is inherently challenging, but we will get through it. Things will get better. And that was American photographer Nikoko in Shanghai tonight in her own words. Here's where we stand on the virus this evening. Confirmed cases in the U.S. have now topped 50,000 with nearly 650 deaths. Renowned American playwright Terrence McNally has died from complications from the virus. He was 81. And officials have postponed the Olympics, saying the Games will take place no later than summer 2021. 
Well, Dr. Sam Torbati is the co-director of the emergency department at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. He is uh, certainly seeing more patients than uh, he predicted. Uh, Dr. Torbati, it's good to have you with us tonight. Can you tell us what you are seeing in L.A. on the front lines? Yes, thank you, Scott. Uh, we are certainly seeing uh, COVID-19. Lots of patients are coming in. At this point, we're into uh, the illness about two or three weeks, and now we're beginning to see more and more patients with more severe disease, pneumonia, respiratory distress, a lot more patients requiring hospitalization. What ages of, of the patients are we talking about? It's, it's such concern in different parts of the country that the, the patients are getting younger. Uh, we are seeing younger patients, um, 20s, 30s, 40s, all across the range. The younger patients tend to do better with this disease, and they're able to hang in there and get better at home. Some still require hospitalization. The older patients who have less reserve, they tend to require hospitalization, and many of them need to go to the ICU for additional care. Can you tell us how the hospital is coping tonight? Do you have the equipment you need? And if not, what do you need? Well, in terms of supplies, like other hospitals, we're monitoring the supply chain very carefully. We're worried about supplies. We've set up a donation page on our website where people or companies can donate. Uh, we're preparing. Right now, we are sort of preparing for the battle. We know that it's going to get tougher and tougher in the weeks and months ahead. We are training, preparing. All of our teams are focused completely on this disease while we're also monitoring our activities with everything else that comes through our door to make sure the patients get the best care possible. I mentioned to our doctor guest earlier the purchase by Elon Musk of the ventilators that he bought from, from China and is, is, has sent to, to California. Do you have any idea if your hospital will be receiving any of those? Not sure, but I know that our executive team is working uh, night and day trying to make sure that we have the supplies we need. And the same issues are just all across California, all across the nation, where all physicians on the front line, in the ICUs, in the rest of the hospital, everyone is concerned and everybody is working super hard to make sure that we have what we need to take care of patients when they need us the most. Yeah. Dr. Torbati, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're grateful for your work and that of your colleagues. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. You bet. We'll talk to you soon. A lot more ahead on this CNBC special report, Markets in Turmoil. After today's major rally for the Bulls, a lot of investors are asking this question. Is the worst over on Wall Street? That's our focus next. Plus, can America's beef producers fight through inevitable logistics challenges to help keep this country fed? This CNBC special report, Markets in Turmoil, is coming right back. Optimism on Wall Street sparked by what is perceived as movement in Washington. Stock surge. In a year of firsts, it was another record-breaking day on Wall Street. The Dow up 11 percent, the most since the economy started emerging from the Great Depression. This CNBC special report, Markets in Turmoil, continues right now. Once again, here's Scott Wapner. Welcome back. We're still waiting on that vote in Washington, D.C. Nonetheless, we'll show you the futures, which seem to be waiting as well. After that very big day on Wall Street, what was a couple hundred point gain for the Dow, looking like uh, an implied open of that is now negative across the board. Don't put too much in this. A volume is light, very thinly traded at this hour and can change many, many times before the morning. Investors betting big today that Congress will soon close the deal on a stimulus package. The Dow having its best point gain ever, more than 2,100 points, its best percentage gain since 1933. The S&P 500 had its best day since 2008. The Nasdaq climbing 8%. Six of the 11 sectors were up more than 10% today, but energy, industrials, and financials were the best of the best. And some of the biggest names in corporate America sounding off today about what's next for their companies how they're managing through these difficult times, and when they think they'll try to reopen for business. It's an uncertain market, which is why we've taken actions on the things that we can control. We can't control the health situation other than work with our employees. We can't control oil prices. Uh, we can control our rate of spend. We can control things like the share buyback. We had already uh, embarked on a restructuring to become more efficient. And so we'll continue to focus on those things. Our dividend is, uh, is our number one priority. It's very secure. We haven't cut the dividend since 1934. This is a, a litmus test for what I think will come. Already China's returning 
the domestic travel is, is returning. Uh, they are talking to us about their orders, and they are talking to us about future orders. So I, I really do believe when we get through this curve and we start going down the other side, this economy will slowly, steadily recover. Starbucks, we've got a strong balance sheet. We've got, uh, we've got the understanding of the model that we learned in China. And so, you know, we believe we've got, uh, we've got the ability to endure through this. We focus on prioritizing the organic business and the dividend uh, and then M&A and, uh, and share buybacks at the bottom. So we, we want to keep our skilled employees because we believe there'll be a rebound. We certainly believe that that group business, uh, when it's safe uh, to come back, will come back. And then you've got business, uh, individual business travelers and you've got individual leisure travelers, vacationers. And that business we think will come back as people get confident about the ability to safely go about living their lives in the case of vacations or doing their work in the case of business travel. Some of the things that we've done for our customers is, you know, we've waived uh, delivery charges for home delivery of prescriptions and, you know, other health-related items. Uh, you know, we have seen nearly a 300 percent increase in, you know, home delivery being utilized. With all these changes, in fact, there is going to be new demand uh, that we will have, that we will have to scale to meet. Uh, and of course, ultimately, we are also going to be dependent on the world doing well for us to do well, but we will weather the storm. Some of our CEOs tonight in their own words. Well, for more on the Dow's record-setting rally today, let's bring in Mark Travis. He's president and CEO with Intrepid Capital, and Kevin Landis, the chief investment officer and portfolio manager with First Hand Capital Management. Good to have you both with us. Uh, Kevin, I start with you. You have the top performing tech sector fund per Morningstar, so that means you must have some pretty good stock picks for me and our viewers this evening. Uh, well, <clears throat> maybe they're just less bad. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. You know, we, we, uh, we were lucky in that we had already uh, put down some bets on distance learning and uh, the move to streaming before all of this mess happened. And that turns out to be um, the, some, some pretty good bets to get us through this. Um, but uh, it, then there's some other names that we had missed the boat on that we, uh, we thought we could uh, uh, use this as an entry point to get back into. So um, nothing really to crow about, but I think we've, uh, we've protected ourselves as best we could. Do you feel like, Kevin, that it's, it's time to start buying stocks? Well, you know, you're talking to a guy who lived through 2000, 2001, and 2002, um, but who also saw, you know, the V, the V-shaped uh, markets in '97 and '98, and all, obviously we all remember 2008. I'm trying to piece together, you know, which attributes of the various train wrecks I've seen in the past this one looks like. It still seems a little early to me, I have to say. Mark, how about yourself? Do you, do you share Kevin's thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, Scott, chaos creates opportunity. And, um, you know, we've been chastised and intrepid for having cash. But in the, you know, that's the old saying in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. With cash on hand uh, and looking for high-quality, smaller-cap shares, we've been buying really over the last two weeks. Um, we still have cash, and we'll continue to put it work where we find attractive uh, balance sheets and businesses that will endure and, uh, you know, be trade at higher valuations three to five years from now, which we believe they will. I, I imagine, Mark, you're, you're asked a thousand times a day whether you think we're, we're at the bottom or, or putting in a bottom. I'm going to make it a thousand and one. You know, Scott, it's interesting to me. I mean, look, I think going into this crisis in mid-February, you know, the expectations were what, for what, $175 earnings in S&P, Trading at a you know pretty high multiple of 19, you back that down to 125, 120, put a 15 multiple on it. You could get as low as 1800. It just seems to me, anecdotally watching, that seems to kind of bounce around between 2200 and 2300 on the S and P. But again, we're talking about the S and P and, and Kevin's trading more in the Nasdaq. The Russell 2000 is off 40 percent year to date. Um, keep in mind that of those small cap companies, one. They're, you know, 40% of them don't make money, and this probably isn't helping them, and a lot of them have leverage. So, you know, it depends on which part of the market you're talking about. Uh, the other part of the market we're in is the short-duration high-yield market, mm -hmm. which, frankly, I think is one of the best risk-adjusted trades. 
uh, this really started to me as kind of a margin call. And um, we had a trillion dollars of kind of low investment grade debt that's now getting blown out of ETFs and out of investment grade mandates. And it's, I think, creating some really double digit uh, return opportunities to go along with some of these small cap companies that are built to last from my perspective. Yeah. Lastly, Kevin, and quickly, if, if you could, how do you buy stocks if you have no way to assess what future earnings are going to be? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you have to look down the road um, and, and ask yourself what this stock is going to be worth in two or three years. And you have to take a look at the potential for growth. So if you're looking at a company like Chegg and distance learning, uh, you're asking yourself, what, how big is this market compared to how big this company is today and how much, how much headroom do they have? Um, but you, you know, you're absolutely right. You're not, you're not making a call on next quarter's earnings. You, that's, uh, that would be uh, fantastical. <laughs> next quarter's being generous. I'm wondering about a few quarters. Anyhow, gentlemen, it's good to have you with us tonight. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, that's, that's Kevin Landis, Mark Travis with us tonight. And up next, moving the beef. How will the industry deal with a new wave of new challenges? Also tonight, doing business in the era of coronavirus. This isn't like a downturn. This is a shutdown. Surviving while shut down. How America's individual businesses are coping. Before the break, images from around the world as the virus attacks. Throughout this crisis, we are hearing from individual business owners from coast to coast. Tonight, one of Philadelphia's largest car dealers who has been forced to stop selling. Here's Dave Kelleher in his own words. This isn't like a downturn. This is a shutdown. We went from 10 cars a day to zero. The governor closed sales for us on Friday. So at that point, we let 57 employees go. We've taken some really big steps to try to liaison our people into the unemployment world. Um, but it's pretty painful. and You can see it in their face and hear it in their emails. So the health is the primary concern, but you can't escape the economic impact. And it's crushing. It's crushing. By April, with a complete shutdown, I'll still have an expense on my balance sheet of about $250,000 a month that I'll have not being open. Rent, insurance, interest payment on all those cars I have on the lot. I have 700 cars on the lot. The electricity is still going to be on the building. I'm covering my employees' health care benefits. I thought that was really important. But if I don't have a valid consumer with credit availability, with, the, with liquidity, with the ability to buy a car, this pandemic is going to extend a lot further than these few months that we're looking at right now. And that was Dave Kelleher tonight, one of Philadelphia's largest auto dealers, in his own words. Well, there is fear in this country, the United States of America, that the coronavirus will cause severe food shortages. With us now is Ethan Lane. He's vice president of government affairs at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. He joins us by phone this evening. Ethan, good for you to be here. Thank you for having me. I'd say where's the beef, but that's too obvious. So I'll ask you, how's the beef? <laughs> What's the state of the industry tonight? Look, first and foremost, there is no shortage of beef in the United States. That's, that's something that I think folks really need to understand. Uh, we have capacity, we have the cattle, we have the, uh, the slaughter facilities up and running, and, and we have the ability to deliver that product to store shelves around the country. And, and importantly, the, the administration's designation of our industry as part of that critical infrastructure is, is what's really going to allow us to continue providing that as we see uh, different portions of this, of this shutdown uh, take effect in different parts of the country. These critical workers that, that you mentioned certainly aren't immune to, to getting sick whether it's those working in slaughterhouses, truckers, your other, your other workers, et cetera. How are you dealing with that? You know, different parts of our industry are tackling that in different ways. We've been in constant communication with our supply chain, uh, whether it be at the feedlot level and those cow-calf operations all the way through uh, uh, packers and processors. And, and they're all working those pandemic plans. They're looking at 
uh, different staffing uh, uh, possibilities to ensure that when and if they start to see uh, infections in those areas, uh, they have the ability to pivot and make sure they still have workers to keep those those plants up and operating and those and those operations moving uh, as, as well on the on the transportation and trucking side. Uh, that's something that they're going to have to continue to manage. Uh, but we're hearing positive signs from from all of those different areas, as we are from the federal government on the inspection side, uh, whether it's FSIS or, or APHIS uh, or the Ag Marketing Service. You know, they're putting their own plans in place to ensure that those inspectors are going to be in there as well, which is also a critical part of that process. You know, I'm thinking of the current situation where the restaurants around this country are closed. Big cities like New York and Chicago, which have an awful lot of steakhouses, almost every other block for, for that matter. How are you being infect, uh, affected by the, the drop off in demand from restaurants being closed? Well, you know, box beef uh, has been flying off the shelves and at the retail level. We've seen a 77 percent surge in, in sales uh, in just since the week of March 15th, which was last week. And I think what we're seeing is a little bit of a pivot from some of those wholesale uh, uh, shipments to the retail side to make sure they meet that consumer demand. Obviously, you know, I'm in Washington, D.C., and we can still get cheeseburgers and steaks delivered from uh, from places around our office in downtown D.C., but clearly their traffic traffic is, is, is off. Uh, but we're seeing consumers, uh, freezers get filled up at the same time. And so that demand shifting to those to those home cooks that are spending the next two, uh, two or three weeks sitting at home watching CNBC. Appreciate that. Ethan, you take care. Thanks for being with us tonight. That's Ethan Lane, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association with us tonight. We'll get you caught up on all of the biz busy headlines this day on the market, the virus next on this CNBC special report, Markets in Turmoil. On day 86 of the coronavirus pandemic, here are the latest headlines tonight. President Trump said he wants the country open and raring to go by Easter. Members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force urging anyone who left the New York City area in the last few days to self-isolate for two weeks. Stocks stage a massive rally today, the Dow rising more than 2,100 points. It's most ever. Futures right now lower across the board. We'll We'll see, things, we'll see where things are in the morning. Go to CNBC.com all night long for up-to-the-minute information on the markets and the virus. Remember, we are back tomorrow night with a special event, The Path Forward. Our guests including former chief economic advisor to President Trump, Gary Cohn, the billionaire investor, Mark Cuban, NASDAQ CEO, Adina Friedman, John Rogers of Aerial Investments, and Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Please send us your questions on Twitter using the hashtag CNBC Path Forward. That's at 7 p.m. Tomorrow. For all of us here at CNBC, I'm Scott Wapner. Please be healthy. Shark Tank is next.